Topping the New York Times bestseller list. The Shack is in the top 40 bestsellers of all history. Having sold millions of copies since its release in 2007, the novel The Shack has become a publishing phenomenon. Now a feature film based on the influential book is to be released in March of 2017. What theology does the book teach? Should faithful Christians be concerned at its impact on the church? Documentary filmmaker Paul Flynn of Megiddo Films has released his latest work, The Shack, Its Dangerous Theology and Error, in an attempt to answer these questions. To watch this film free of charge, please visit our website at megiddofilms.org. That's megiddofilms.org. You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 7th of March, 2017. Thank you all for tuning in on tonight's show. We're going to be talking about The Shack and some of the reaction from the movie. Um, as it's been out a few days and again, there's been a lot of bit more to be talking about. I'm going to try and wrap it up today. I was planning on looking at C. Baxter Kruger's work, The Shack Revisited today. And um, I might do it in a few weeks again, depending on if people are still talking about this issue. <clears throat> and... Uh, if people really want to see how heretical the shack is, that book is the book to read. And, <clears throat> I mean, it's a book that's been endorsed by William Paul Young himself. William Paul Young is the author of the shack. And William Paul Young, I'm kind of paraphrasing now, but he sa it says on the front of the book, if you want to understand the, the thoughts or the theological concepts of the shack, this book is for you. Basically saying in that and the preface that if you want to understand the shack, the theology behind the shack, if you want to call it the systematic theology or the more in-depth theology of the shack, and I might go through that in a few weeks' time, actually. Um, but I just kind of need to take a break from it probably after this show. And if you want more in-depth analysis, go to the movie The Shack. It's theological... It's dangerous, theolo it's dangerous Theology and Error, and you can watch that for free on YouTube, or you can go to the website, megidofilms.org. And where do you start with... The, the main focus of today's show is going to be this. What does the shack say about the modern church? What does it say about the modern church? It's saying a lot of things because you either talk to some people and they'll say, heresy, complete joke. And then you have some people saying, I don't see what the problem is. I came out thinking it was a wonderful movie and people saying different things like that. And that they couldn't see the problem with such blasphemy and heresy. And what's disturbing about it, it's not just... A, tiny segment. It's a pretty large segment of the visible church. Now, I don't know these people's churches, but you see it exposes. Rather than church exposing the shack, the popularity of the shack in certain churches exposes those churches. And if your church is promoting the shack, at best, at best, it is grossly inadequate when it comes to discernment. It hasn't a clue. It hasn't a clue about the second commandment. Sadly, most of evangelicalism doesn't know anything about the second commandment and its moral application that no images of God are acceptable. None. No similitudes. No representations are lawful. In God's law. 
And of course, the second commandment is not is a summarization of the principle. We do not use our imagination and how we view God or how we see God or what we think about God in worship or in anything else. We are not to represent him in art. He is the word. And we're not to use our imaginations in order to come to him. So-called Christians in church history that have used their imagination to come to God, people like the Jesuits, leaders of the Counter-Reformation. If you want to summarize their spiritual exercises, it would be this. At times, they would take <clears throat> a scene from the Bible, maybe the Lord's Supper, and then use their imagination and that has become rife in the modern church. Also, what exposed the lack of discernment, <clears throat> and, but it was a bit more forgivable than this, was the passion of the Christ, the popularity of the passion of the Christ. And that filled with Roman Catholic teaching, but also it was a violation of the second commandment. Even if everything else was right, it would still be condemned in Scripture. The whole excuse, and we'll get into in one, I'm going to play a few clips from different, different programs and things like that, and some, Lord willing, hopefully we get to some uh, clips from William Paul Young talking about some of the criticisms. In a while, hopefully, there's uh, enough time in the show. Just before we get into uh, the meat, or the, the contents of today's show, just want to give you a bit of an update. Okay, this... Show will, Lord willing, go up on the 7th of March. Uh, I'm not going to be able to record a show for Thursday this week. And also not for next week either. Now, I've been thinking about for a while just to take a break from a bunch of things ministry-wise. Uh, yeah, There's been shows that have been missed over the last, basically since the, the uh, new year. And apologize for that. It's been mainly due. I've been kind of seem to be picking up bugs and different things back and forth seems to be happening. Nothing majorly serious, but just um, so that I don't have a ton of energy left over to record at the end of the week. That's basically been what it is. Uh, I haven't missed like even in, my, in a normal day to day things. I've only like I missed one day of work and that was it. So in case anybody's too worried, but please keep me in your prayers. And I kind of want to take a break where I'm actually not ill or in bed all the time and, and to catch up with some work related to Mito Films, new work on that. And, um, and look, even if I wanted to, I just uh, won't actually be able to get in here <laughs> into um, this room to be able to record the show. So I just thought it's a perfect time to do it. And um, Lord willing, we'll be back. The next show after this will be March the 21st, unless something changes, but it'll, next year will be on March 21st. Anything else, if there's anything prior to that, will probably be on the YouTube channel, maybe a vlog if some major news breaks. Um, but often I don't have enough time to cover a lot of things. There are loads of stories. Hopefully I'll write some things for the, the Megiddo Review. If you're not aware of the kind of the, you could say it's kind of a blog, magazine, whatever you want to call it. If you go to the Review.com. There are written articles there. I don't know how many are there, and there's videos, vlogs, and other things like that there. Okay, let's get on to our topic. So anyways, so today I'm going to try and focus on what does the shack say or expose about the modern church. Very least, lack of discernment, if not complete apostasy. It is a, It is not, the shack itself is not the problem. The shack is, well, obviously it's a problem, it's heresy, but... It exposes or reveals the underlying problems. That we don't have enough theology that when God... Let's, let's put this in the perspective here, right? When pe a large chunk of Christian media, so-called Christian media, <coughs> and a large chunk, I don't know what percent, of the evangelical, professing evangelical church has no problem with a movie and a book that attacks the idea of Sola Scriptura because even the note that Mac receives in the, in the shack puts, <coughs> excuse me, um, has a low view of Sola Scriptura. Basically that 
yes, God does still continue. That is the message of the movie and the book. That God still continues to speak. It, it kind of, it brings that up in the book. <clears throat> Excuse me. It brings that up in the book. It actually talks about it. And I'll just go to that quote where it's, if anybody's, again, I'm trying not to misrepresent it. You may, you may disagree with something, and we should always strive to represent fairly what we are critiquing. In the shack, um, it's on page 93. And, oh, excuse me. No, here we go. Oh, yeah, yeah. I see where I've gone wrong. Anyway, so, in seminary, okay, so this is Mac. Mac is speaking here. This is actually page 65 and 66 in the shack. In seminary, he had been taught that God had completely stopped any overt communication with moderns, preferring to have them only listen to and follow sacred scripture. Properly interpreted, of course. God's voice had been reduced to paper, and even that paper had to be moderated and deciphered by the proper authorities and intellects. Nobody wanted God in a box, just in a book. Now, I deal with this in the, in the movie, so I'm not going to spend too, too long on this as well. Already by that point, the, the note comes up on page 16 of the book where Papa, representing God the Father, basically the note is, Mackenzie, it's been a while. I've missed you. I'll be at the shack next weekend if you want to get together. It's completely different to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which was anytime God spoke was the word of God being quoted and actually even mentioning the passage as well. Here, it's he talks about the word of God, and then he says, in summary, he'd been taught, right, that God had stopped any overt communication with moderns, referring to have them all listen to sacred scripture. Nobody wanted God in a box, just in a book. So it's denigrating, kind of going, you know what? I didn't want God in a box, but, and then the book teaches, yes, God does continue to speak to moderns. Very, very similar to the charismatic movement. CBN has been kind of very much, uh, the Christian Broadcasting Network, very much em embracing the shack and seems to pub promote it all the way through. I just see some of the list of the endorsements going right back to, I don't want to lose some of the page, re page references there. I mean, it was endorsed by Pat Robertson 700 Club back when it came out a number of years ago and a number of other places as well, and doesn't seem to get the criticism. At least that's the way it's putting it forth. And, and there's plenty of other quotes as well, but for the sake of time and for the sake of time in the movie, there wasn't enough time to go through everything. But it's at a, obviously a very low view that God has ceased, quote, overt communication to modern, or with moderns, preferring only to have them listen and follow the sacred scripture. There's kind of a, a disparaging tone, and as I said in the book, as I said in the movie, sorry, here the idea that God has spoken in his written word, and that we, have, that we trust in this alone is to reduce his word somehow. This is a classic attack in Sola Scriptura, and this belief that God is still revealing special revelation to man is a road to confusion, and I quote then 1 Corinthians 14.33. So there's a massive problem. Now, just so you don't pick up on that, and sadly the church doesn't have a grounding in Sola Scriptura. That is, what is that? Only what Martin Lloyd-Jones referred to like that during when he was alive, the time when he was alive, that we have, that we have gone to a pre-Reformation state. We're, we're going to the ignorance that we were in the Roman Catholic Church, what well, became known as the Roman Catholic Church later, what was the Middle Ages, ignorance of Sola Scriptura, ignorance of many ma major doctrines. The Sola Scriptura was the major argument of Martin Luther when he was arguing against the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Rome. He appealed to Scripture. 
But this is being undermined by modern evangelicals. False views of the Trinity. <coughs> Excuse me. False views of the Trinity. No problem with that. No problem with blasphemous representations of God. God being represented as a black African woman. And this has nothing to do with race. And it has nothing even to do with the fact that it's a woman. Even though, even if he could, it would still be as a man, because that is the way God reveals himself. He, but we are not supposed to use any similitude, and that is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses uh, 12 to 16, but I'll get into that. Well, no problem with blasphemous images of God. I cannot even seem to fathom. Yeah, of course, heretics have reasons why they represented it so. Yeah, I know in the book that Mac, his character, couldn't deal with the fact, couldn't deal with a father at that time, and could deal better with a mother. Yeah, so God is just changeable and malleable, comes to us in whatever way suits us. So God really submits to us. He's no longer, he no longer ceases to change. You know, God comes to us in our terms. This is the way the shack presents it. And not the other way around. It's heresy. It is absolutely blasphemous, and it denigrates the word of God. There's feminism in here because it completely rejects hierarchy, attacks it in the home, attacks it in the marriage, is against institutions such as marriage and the church. I, they don't have any problem with this. No, no, I'm going to give people the benefit of doubt. Um, if I get a chance to play this clip from a radio program in a second from, it's called the... The Wally Show and one of the few programs I could actually get that I could actually see was actually talking about it. I'm just trying to <clears throat> gather together the feelings or the opinions of evangelicals. And this is what I've been able to find. A universalistic gospel. Of course, the publisher, Wayne Jacobson, denies this. He wrote a blog a number of years ago, back in 2008, called Is the Shack Heresy? And in that, yeah, it's Wayne Jacobson wrote this, he said, does the, back, does the book promote universalism? Some people can find a universalist under every bush. This book flatly states that all roads do not lead to Jesus, so that he's erecting a straw man of the pagan universalism, not Christian universalism, so-called Christian universalism, where... All will eventually come through Jesus, even in hell. Eventually hell will be emptied and all this kind of stuff. It is not that form of universalism that William Paul Young promotes. While it affirms that Jesus can find his followers wherever they may, they may have wandered into sin or false beliefs, just because he can find followers in the most unlikely places does not validate those places. I don't know how we, we could have been clear, but people will quote portions out of context and draw a false conclusion. Now, again, I quoted a number of times C. Baxter Kruger, who William Paul Young says of him, if you, and listen, am I taking this out of context? If you want to understand better the principles and theologies that the, the theology that frames the shack, this book is for you. And what does this book say? about, he says on page 247 of the Shack Revisited, the hope of the human race is that we belong to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We always have and always will. The human race has always belonged. That's C. Baxter Kruger, and he's explicitly, undeniably, a universalist. When he's talking about Missy's murderer, he talks about Mrs. Murder. No mention of repentance that Mrs. Murder ever repented and came into relationship with God. And he says, well, talking about Mrs. Murderer, if you, you know, um, if anybody is not aware of the, the movie The Shack and or the, 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 the plot line in the, in the book, Missy Mac's daughter is murdered and it's called Ladybug, Ladybug Killer. Um, I think that's the name anyway. Hmm, name escapes me. Anyway, he's a, a serial killer. And he talked, and C. Baxter Kruger, in the Shack Revisit, said, while the murderer is forgiven, loved, and accepted, what he is embraced and included, he does not know it by any stretch of the imagination. 
and such unknowing leaves him reading in pain and trapped in the clutches of darkness. He belongs to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always has, always will. But he's given himself to participate in darkness. And then at the end, he gives a classic line of a universalist. He says, a little bit later, he has become a terrible monster living in the alien form of existence in violation of his true self in Christ. He belongs to Christ, apparently, according to C. Baxter Kruger. And this alien existence, the state which he's in, he's unconverted, must be transformed in the fire of Jesus' love. So, and William Paul Young says exactly the same thing, that that fire of hell is transformative, kind of purgatorial, transforming people, going in there, rooting out that lie, and bringing people relentlessly to God. The hope of the human race, page 247 of that book, is that we belong to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The human race, everybody. We always have and always will. Now, there's other people want me to um, get a films at gmail.com. I'll do a show just on C. Baxter Kruger's very revealing work, which William Paul Young loves. And William Paul Young thinks C. Baxter Kruger is positively brilliant. And he said it a number of times, and he seem, they seem to be, at least they still think they're close friends. I, I say that because Wayne Jacobson, who stands up for the shack, they haven't always been best of buddies. Uh, and I've mentioned this before. While they can seem like they're all together, this is, I don't know if it's just all about money, because back in 2010, 2011, no, actually 2009, Young, filed a lawsuit back in, in November 2009 against Brad Cummings and Wayne Jacobson. Windblown Media countersued for $5 million in federal court. So they're not all, they haven't always been getting along. It has been, they've brought each other to the court, Wayne Jacobson and Brad Cummings, who edited The Shack and um, claim authorship, apparently, as well. ALA Times said the flack over The Shack. This is back in 2010. William Paul Young's best-selling novel about a father's re renewal, renewal f of faith after suffering an unspeakable tragedy has, sp has spawned a tangle of lawsuits over royalties and even the book's authorship. So, yeah, while, while it may seem that they're all loving and very, you know, and they bring forth this facade and virtue signaling, in the background, they're wrangling over millions of dollars. This is big business to them. Now, be that as it may. Okay, we're going to look at... Where will we look at first? Um, before we get into more, just to go back to something we were talking about in the last show, and we were looking at Huffing the Huffington Post article, we still have in front of me, uh, where basically there were, he, the author is implying very clearly that it's, you know, the only problem with the shack is these white theologians have a massive problem with God being black. Not just the Huffington Post variety, also when it's when it reviewed the movie a few days ago back on the 2nd of March, Owen Glibberman stated that he said, there's a new God in town, referring to Octavia Spencer's portrayal. And um, some members of the American evangelical community are already up in arms over the portrayal for reasons that are pretended not to be racist. I don't want to spend a lot of time in it. It's a ridiculous argument. Again, what does the left do? They just attribute racism to the other side without any evidence whatsoever. And they just, ah, you see, we like this. Oh, <laughs> you know, racism everywhere. And it's just kind of, yeah, keep doing it because you'll just, people will hopefully, if there's any sanity left, will actually wise up to the fact that the media, the, the mainstream media, in the United States, in the, West, in the West at least, is a complete joke. It's losing credibility. Their ratings are dropping like crazy. And people aren't listening. 
as much anymore. I'm not saying that it's turning in the right direction towards God, and that's a problem. The populations around the world, due to Trump, Brexit, and the European Union, positions on the European Union, uh, positions on Islam, societies have been, I haven't been this polarized in a very long time, and it's, we're entering into, humanly speaking, a really dangerous time. We are. We need to pray for this situation, but um, again, labeling, oh, you don't like this, oh, look at this position that they have, oh, it's because they're racist, they're pre oh, and they're pretending not to be racist, they're just, they're closet racist, it's the same thing with the, you know, because if a Christian opposes homosexuality, oh, they must be a closet homosexual. We should never, we might disagree with somebody on the left or whatever, it doesn't matter who it is, we should never attribute motive unless the word of God is explicitly clear. If the only motive that we can be explicitly clear about in the word of God is that they hate God. We don't want to kind of attribute anything else. We don't know what's going through somebody's mind beyond that. If they're un unconverted, they are hardened, they're reprobates from the truth. We notice in Romans 1, we notice in Romans 3, Psalm 14, Psalm... All the Psalms, really. That they will not come to God, and that is why they run into absurdities. We notice from the Word of God, we should never attribute and speculate ever on people's motivations. I don't know what William Paul Young's motivation is. I can go off little bits of evidence here and there. I can see him avoiding answering questions, which we'll see in a second if we get a chance to play. So again, the left is attributing racism to opposition, which is kind of funny because it, nobody seems to be that gone on the... On the movie, it even says at the end of this review in, in, in Variety, it reduces faith to a kind of spiritual comfort food. Again, what is the evangelical church doing today? And what does the, the shack, what does the shack say about large segments of the Western church? What does it say? Massive, gross, Biblical ignorance. And it's a damning indictment of the modern church. Okay, I'm going to play now a clip from William Paul Young. William Paul Young was interviewed recently enough by CBN News. And CBN News claimed, at least, this is their program Studio 5, they claimed that they were the only crew allowed on the set. So, and I can see why, because they're very, very favorable Probably the most favorable that I've seen on a on a professing Christian side towards on a TV side at least towards the shack, and this is probably why they've been let on. Okay, so play here uh, this interview, and then William Paul Young's answering a question about what does he say to his critics. With success also comes critics, and I know that you've ah, heard my people, people, yeah, people being critical of the fact that you, of how you chose to portray God. You misunderstand the mystery. Though a work of fiction, some have called Young's depiction of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit profoundly unbiblical. One seminary professor wrote his own book in response called Burning Down the Shack. What do you say to them? We need to be challenged about how we think. And a lot of times, people's responses are based in they're afraid. And I know that because I lived in that world. So when a person's upset, they're not coming to tell me. I love that. You know why they're, you know why they're against me? Against the book? They're afraid. And why? Because I know them. Yeah, I've been, I've been in the church. So you know every single motive of every single person in the church. What utter arrogance. And it's... It's preposterous virtue signaling. And he, he is a leftist. He talks like a leftist. He acts like a leftist. And kind of goes, oh, you're just acting in a fear. Not actually dealing with the arguments. Never. Not with scripture. With philosophizing foolish human philosophy. 
So you just saw they're acting in a fear. Not that there's any genuine biblical reason to be concerned about this movie. About me. I already know about me. They're coming to tell me in the... I already know about me. What utter arrogance. No, you don't know about you. <laughs> Sadly, you don't. If you, if the person who says, I'm good, I don't need the word of God, I don't need anybody telling me or correcting me, that is a dangerous place to be in. Even if you're a genuine Christian, this, is, this man is not a Christian. This man has, teaches a false gospel, along with his partner in crime, C. Baxter Kruger, when he goes around speaking with him, to teach universalism. And anybody around her, whether it's Brad Cummings or Wayne Jacobson or anybody else in that that's riding this gravy train and doesn't want to let the cat out of the bag is either ignorant or lying. I don't know which. I'm going to try and give the benefit of the doubt. The best one is ignorant. But they never actually deal with the arguments. It's constantly dealing with straw men. Never what people are actually saying and why this might be seen as blasphemous. Not interested, because he already knows about me. Anyway. The only language they know how about what matters to them. And if I'm not at risk, I can step inside that space. No, so it's the only language that they know how. Fear. Because he had a bad experience. And if you don't, you're not aware, William Paul Young had a really, really, from what I can see at least, a really, really rough childhood. He was abused. Missionary kids, I think, sexually abused for a long time as a, as a child. Uh, I can't remember the actual country he was in. I think it might have been Africa, but um, some part of Africa anyway. And so his view that of anybody coming to him, it's out of fear. Like, it sounds like a horrendous situation he was in when he was a child. But I can say the same thing. You're acting out of fear. How will we forget about motives? And how will we actually, how about deal actually deal with the criticisms being laid your way because you don't you find clever ways and he is a clever man it's not a it's not a, a thumbs up for him it's actually more of a condemnation upon him he's not a stupid man he's a very <laughs> he knows how to use language he's very careful and he knows how to avoid controversy but he also knows how to sell his ideas Maybe ask a good question, maybe stay silent, but respectful, because it is about the dignity of the other and the journey that the other is in. And in Max's fictional journey, he sees Jesus as a Middle Eastern man, the Holy Spirit as an Asian woman, and God as a black woman. Don't ever think that what my son chose to do didn't cost us both dearly. How does Papa, you portraying that role, come? Okay, this is before... And I hope when I'm editing this uh, TV show that I'll actually edit that part out. Um, violates the second commandment, and it, it, it's shameful. Anyway. To talk about William Paul Young's comments, and there's some comments at the end of the Studio 5 program, which basically says, no, the problem's not with me. I'm good. It's you. It's all you. It's all on you. You're the... You're, you know, you're the problem. And, well, in that clip that was just played there, just, I'm skipping ahead a little bit to another thing he said later on. He says, well, you know, I'm on my journey. Max on his journey, as the narrator said on this. And Max's journey, he says, sees Jesus as this. And he sees the Holy Spirit as this. And God the Father as this. Uh, but, you know what? You could see God in a different way. That's idolatry. You cannot, you, we can't, again, it's scripture or we will use our imagination. The God of your imagination does not save. The God of scripture saves. We cannot come to God in our imagination. Because that means we will, because our, our minds and our hearts and our wills are sinful, we will add to scripture. Before I skip ahead, I'm just going to 
Hmm. Actually, we're going to stick to William Paul Young. Look, I know people write articles about what is said by, you know, either Sam Worthington or Octavia Winslow. Is that her name? I haven't really been paying attention to the... Yeah, Octavia Spencer, sorry. Octavia Spencer and Sam Worthington. I haven't really been paying attention to the actors. Look, I know, look. There is obviously a massive problem with a lot of these people. They're not Christians and things like that. But at the end of the day, I kind of want to deal with the core, the author, the person, the author says, teaches, or, you know, if you want to understand the theology more, The Shack Revisited, that book goes in, and there's actually a series of sermons I'm going to have to go through that I found the other day, um, done by C. Baxter Kruger and William Paul Young together. It's on C. Baxter Kruger's uh, YouTube page, but I'll probably go through it at some stage in the future, and if there's anything interesting, come back to this issue. But I might, this might be the last show I do on this issue, really, you know, it's, I'm kind of hoping to leave it behind, and I just, re the reason I'm doing it is not, okay, there's been a lot more traffic and things like that, but primarily the people who are caught trusting the God of their own imagination will turn from that folly and turn to Christ. It breaks my heart. If somebody comes to me and says that they love the shack, and I come to them with scripture why it's wrong, and they reject that, and they embrace the shack, I have to honestly say, do you know Christ? Are you actually a Christian? Because in my eyes, you no longer have a, a credible profession of faith. I can no longer be anyway confident if I was in the past that you're actually a Christian I can't say categorically we don't know people's hearts and things like that but we're going from is it a credible profession of faith that's what you that's how you get admission into a church that's how you become a member of a church a credible profession of faith you confess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're willing to follow him at least in an observable way you know there can be false converts within that and we can't and we shouldn't go any further than that only what we can observe we can't micromanage people's lives and things like that but from <clears throat> if you love the god of the shack if you truly love the god of the shack or the god of your own imagination you hate the god of scripture you don't love the god of the scriptures you want a god that is conjured up in your imagination or somebody else's imagination it is not the god of scripture there's no comparison with them every i can't think of anything in this movie that is correct even the little part that they played in the cbn thing where papa has nail scars in his wrist the book teaches a somewhat semi-modalistic heresy basically that the father was also crucified with the son no, the son was crucified. The son bore the wrath of the father. What? The publishers. Wayne Jacobson and Brad Cummings. Reject that. They just say it's Christ died for us, but not to satisfy the wrath of the father, which is plainly laid out in one of the clearest parts, Isaiah 53 verse 10. William Paul Young, I can't remember, I don't know what the actual radio program was, but it was dealt with on Wretched TV when uh, Todd Friel was talking about The Shack, and he played a clip from a radio program where William Paul Young, I think you can find it on uh, Wretched TV's YouTube channel, William Paul Young stated that he does not believe, he's not a penal substitution kind of guy. And as Todd rightly pointed out after that, well... You're not a penal substitution kind of guy. You are not a Christian. And this is the thing. This man is not a Christian. This is a, he is a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. And he knows evangelical language, and he doesn't want you to know, because if it's known, it will hurt. I have to say, like, that it'll hurt sales. He's not being forthright and admitting openly that he's a universalist. 
And even they brought up some of the criticisms, some of the books written. I uh, have it actually here. One of the books written in opposition against the Shack Seminary Professor. And he, he claims to have known William Paul Young. This is a book, book written by James B. D. Young. And he said in the, is it the introduction or preface? Is the preface. He stated how William Paul Young, while well, he knew him, rejected biblical orthodoxy and embraced universal reconciliation. And if that's not true, I don't hear any rejection of that. I don't know the movie. I have no desire to see the movie, nor am I ever going to see the movie. But the book says in page 182, Jesus says, or the Shaq's Jesus, I have no desire to make them Christians. He says in page 203, the Holy Spirit says, I have a great fondness of uncertainty. So on and so forth. Everything I can think, I can't think of, I can't think of anything they did right in the, in the book. Oh, it says, talks about love and forgiveness. But what love is it representing? Not the love of God. Compete, libertarian, do what you, do what thou wilt. That's satanic. Lust. Not. Biblical love. So, doesn't even get love right, not even close. And forgiveness doesn't get that right either. It presents a repent, you know, you do not need to repent, you've already been forgiven. The only thing is, it's just for forgive yourself. You essentially are a god. Everyone is a little god in the shack. People don't have a problem with that. Okay, what will we play next? I'm going to just concentrate on, for the sake of time, and if this, if this time later on, I'll come back. This is the end of this Studio 5 program on the shack, and I'm just going to play this clip and comment on some comments made by William Paul Young recently. We all live with two things, love and loss. All of our divisions go away when we start getting inside eyeball to eyeball. Yeah, but does that make it right? So, oh, look at what we've got in common. Love and loss. Uh, what kind of love? Self-love. If you, if you don't love Christ, you have self-love and... Hmm. It's, that's not the, the love Paul was preaching in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Anybody man preaches any other gospel, just like William Paul Young... Let him be a curse. Let him be an anathema. Second John talks about not receiving false teachers into your home. Hmm. So love, yes. Uh, but what kind of love? Biblical love and loss. Yeah, we've lost something. But how does that... How does the self-centeredness... Yeah, it might bring us together because we're all in love with ourselves. But it's not a biblical unity that the Bible talks about having the mind of Christ. Nothing to do with it. So you're going to bamboozle people with virtue signaling is what you're saying, William Paul Young, and, and come off kind of all pious sounding. That's going to work on somebody who doesn't, who is a very religious but hasn't, doesn't know God. And Whenever they see a criticism like this or anything like that, they'll just call the person judgmental. Oh, what a horrible position the evangelical church is in today. All and talk about love and loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of this comes rooted in loss. And uh, I grew up in the church. I grew up uh, with, uh, you know, Gandalf with a bad attitude, God. And, uh, <laughs> and it took me a lot. And again, that is another violation of the Second Commandment. You use that image of what you think of God, if, look, even if William Paul Young presented 
God the Father as a you know long flowing beard and all that. That would be a violation of the second commandment. The whole point of the second commandment is using images to view God because it corrupts. Talks about in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse sixteen, talking about. Uh, I'll read verse fifteen for context. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude or likeness or representation that work be rendered on the day that the Lord spake to you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. It corrupts. Thomas Watts in the 17th century Puritan uh, talks about, in a question on page 25 of the Ten Commandments, said, why is it that we are prone to idolatry? He says, because we are led much by visible objects and love to have our senses pleased. Men naturally fancy a God that they may see, though it be such a God that cannot see them, yet they would see it. The true God is invisible, which makes the idolater worship something that he can see. And another part that would really link in with this as well, of course, he's not writing with the shack, but issues that relate to the shack, that images, trying to find the co here, images are teachers of lies. They're teachers of lies. Not just that they kind of go one direction or another, but that they are teachers of lies. Lies. I'm trying to find the exact spot here. It's on page 27 of it, noted down. Um, ah, here we go. So I'll read the full quote here because it's, I love Thomas Watson on the Ten Commandments. I need to read more of Thomas Watson, but another book I just really recommend to get is The Ten Commandments by Thomas Watson. He says, in page, starting page 26, See the goodness of God to our nation in bringing us out of mystic Egypt delivering us from popery, which is Romish idolatry, and causing the light of his truth to break forth glorious among, gloriously among us. In former times, and more lately, in the Marian days, England was overspread with idolatry. It worshipped God after a false manner, and it is idolatry, not only to worship a false god, but the true God in a false manner. Such was our case formerly, we had purgatory, indulgences, and idolatrous mass. The scriptures locked up in an unknown language, invocation of saints and angels and image worship. Images are teachers of lies. Habakkuk 2.18 Wherein do they teach lies? They represent God who cannot be seen in a bodily shape. He quotes in the scriptures um, in, in Deuteronomy 4.12, where it says, Ye saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. Quotes Ambrose, who said, God cannot be pictured by any figure, not the soul even, being a spirit, much less God. To whom then will ye liken God? Isaiah 40, verse 18. The papists say, they worship God by the image, which is a great absurdity. For if it be absurdity to fall down to the picture of a king, when the king himself is present, much more to bow down to the image of God, when God himself is present. And I know people will probably say, oh, we're not worshiping God, but you're representing the one who you claim to worship. This will corrupt who you... It doesn't have to be in purely corporate worship, this corrupts what you think and what you think you know about God. Continue with the quote, What is the popish religion but a bundle of ridiculous ceremonies? And talks about that. But I love that quote. Images are teachers of lies. And this book teaches lies about God, lies about God the Father, lies about Christ, lies about the Holy Spirit, lies about the Trinity, the nature of the Trinity, lies about the Bible, Lies about the gospel.
And people see no problem. No, no. Uh, let, let's just see what does William Paul Young say to the critics who will point this out. Of time took me 50 years to actually become a child. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I was able to take 50 years of history and give a gift for Christmas to my kids. How many times have we actually made changes that are beneficial in our lives when things were just going great? You know, we need to be challenged about how we think. And a lot of times, people's responses are based in they're afraid. And I know that because I lived in that world and I'm, that's my people, right? Mm -hmm. So when a person's upset, they're not coming to tell me about me. I already know about me. They're coming to tell me in the only language they know how about what matters to them. And if I'm not at risk, I can step inside that space, maybe touch nose to nose, maybe ask a good question, maybe stay silent, but respectful, because it is about the dignity of the other and the journey that the other is in and finding a way to celebrate that. So consider... Th yeah, it's about subjective Christianity. You're on a different journey, I'm on a different journey, Max sees it this way. Yeah, that's what the charismatic movement has brought in, by the way, and... Uh, anyway. What does the host say after this? This, the next time someone misinterprets your good intention. The problem may have more to do with them than actually you. That is oh, that's great. <laughs> you know what I mean? CBN, no wonder you were invited on the... Uh, no wonder you were invited on the movie set. Yeah. Anybody comes to you, the problem could be with them. In the nicest way possible, they're very much implying because they're not they're not on the side of the critics they're very much on the side of the shack which they think is absolutely wonderful now i know they'll probably claim to be object or objective look i have a bias i pray that it is the glory of god that i want to follow the scriptures The only time you hear William Paul Young quoting the scriptures is when he wants to torture a verse and use it to prove, in his own eyes, his universalistic gospel. Again, he cannot, and they cannot get away from C. Baxter Kruger's book, The Shack Revisited, but they do not want to admit openly that universalism is taught, they erect a straw man. Again, they're not teaching, the book does not teach pagan universalism. Criticism from James DeYoung and others is not the pagan universalism is taught. He actually writes about that in the book. That's not what William Paul Young teaches. Yes, he teaches there's only one way to cry, uh, the only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. He acknowledges that in the book. But it's a form of quote unquote Christian universalism, which is taught in the book. We got to be careful with our critique, make sure that it is accurate. And because it's easy for them then to set up a straw man in opposition to what we're saying. Now, I just want to look at a few other things. Okay, we're going to play a clip now from this is from the Wally show. Don't know a lot about it. And, but it seems pretty typical of supporters of the book or the, the movie. Although the host here says that he hasn't seen it. This is after that they saw the pre-screening of The Shack back in, I think it was in February, last month, that they saw a pre-screening of it. And I don't know how big the show is or anything like that, but we're just going to play a clip and respond to it. This is from The Wally Show, which is part of Way FM. Book. I just remember at the time, we're not gonna, we're not going to spoil the movie. But I remember the time when The Shack came out, we had had a conversation about it on the air, and people were going crazy. They were, there were people on one side going, this has radically altered my view of faith in Christ. And they're like, it became this big like, moment in their life. And then there were other people that were like, this is the worst thing ever, and it is you know, tearing down religion. We're going to boycott it. We're going to burn the books. Like It got crazy. And so we talked about it one night, and our phones blew up, and my email blew up, and people just mattered in fish grease. And like, you whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. That's that really mean? mad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. That's an old drop we had from the Total Access days. I didn't <laughs> from know. a caller we had. Yeah, uh, madder than fish grease. Uh, and so we've done this way too long. 
And so, like, I went into this movie remembering all of that anger. And so I'm looking at the movie. I'm like, okay, here comes the part. Where's the part where everyone got mad? Well, it's got to be coming up. It's got to be coming. I get to the end of the movie. I'm like, why was everybody mad? <laughs> like, I don't see what was causing that sort of anger from it. And I could see if you. Uh, really? God the Father is represented as a black woman. A woman. God reveals himself as male, not God, not goddess, but God. And you don't have a problem with it. Now, evangelicalism is cast aside and has no problem with violations of the Second Commandment, images of Christ. Sadly, that has been rejected for a long time. But that doesn't say... Mm, maybe there's something wrong here. The fact that they're they're kind of somewhat modalistic, not completely modalism, but definitely modalism, in the sense of it, the book teaches that God the Father was there with Christ on the cross, and it definitely you know the movie teaches that as well. I'll just give you some quotes from the book. I mean. He goes through the entire... He's a professing Christian. And this is a professing Christian radio program. Don't know a ton about it, to be honest. And he will go through the entire thing. Now, okay, he hasn't read the book. But the movie's based on the book. I know there's, there was... I can't remember the exact change, but there's not... You know, there's not a massive difference between them. A book... Now, he probably doesn't know this, that, look, the book, te look, the, look at the, this is what the book teaches. Page 225. In Jesus, I have forgiven all humans for their sins against me, but only some choose relationship. There's universalism. Mercy triumphs over justice because of love. That's on page 164. Your understanding of God is wrong. Page 162 to 164. I am not one who will condemn most to an eternity of torment. I just like... Yeah. I'm not aware of the book getting anything right. So this only leads me to the conclusion that large chunks... I don't know what percentage, and I don't want to speculate what percentage... Large chunks of the evangelical church has a subjective, imaginative view of God conjured up in their own sinful brains, and they are lost. Can't come to any other conclusion. I'm not saying everybody who didn't have a problem with the movie is lost. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're in that state, I would seriously go to 1 John and, and seriously repent. You need to repent. Because you have, you're a babe in Christ at best, with no knowledge of the scriptures. You went into the movie as a theologian looking for holes in the theology. You're going to find them. You're going to find that in any It's not movie. a theology book. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, it's fine. You know, it talks about God, but just, it's not a theology book. It can say whatever it wants. Oh, that canard is coming out yeah when it's when it's good and they like it oh now it's a great help when it's heretical and wrong oh well that's not a theology theology book it's not claiming to be and you'll find it with any christian movie so it's okay to be blasphemous about god is it you don't care about that do you care about the honor and glory of god it does not seem that you do yeah, right. there's no piece of art that is a complete theology. Right. right. And it, so if that's what you're... And this is why we're not supposed to use art for the Godhead. This is not, a, this is not like Pilgrim's Progress where Christian and different people using it for walking along and the Christian walk and different uh, difficulties that can happen and or backsliding or going through the narrow gate. Biblical pictures are things that are already in the scriptures. That's not what this is. 
This is taking God and using your imagination. And not only that, it's in complete, it's, it's complete 180 degrees removed from the God of the Scriptures. It gets the Trinity wrong. It gets the Gospel wrong. It gets God the Father wrong. It gets God, God the Son wrong. It gets God the Holy Spirit wrong. It gets Sola Scriptura wrong. It gets the Trinity wrong. It gets love wrong. It gets forgiveness wrong. Oh, and it's not a theology book. You're always going to find problems. What has it gotten right? Except the Bible. Looking for. <laughs> but that's not a piece of art. I think so. I think it's beautiful. But th this movie had so many, like, just, there's so much beautiful imagery, not just in the uh, cinematography, which was so pretty, but also in how they portrayed God in that relationship. Like, I thought there were some really moving parts to it. Rebe from the blog report read the book the week before because she wanted to really know what the controversies could be and know for herself. She said that she had a way harder time with the book than the movie. Mm. Okay. Because the book, she said she got caught up in so many, like, it was very detailed, she said, in the descriptions of things. And for you to think, wait, is it really like that? But the movie is a, a big picture, kind of. Okay. So, Marty, you read half the book, I guess? You didn't get no, the whole I thing? read it all oh, did. years ago. And I kept thinking, it's got to get better. It's got to get better. <laughs> no, I think the biggest criticism that she had, this woman who's talking here, is that it was boring. Yeah, and I really didn't think it was a boring book to read. But anyway, but that's not, I'm not going to come on here and talk about a book claiming to be Christian or otherwise and criticize it or waste my time talking about it because it may be boring. You know, there's better things to talk about. Well, people don't seem to, professing Christians, large chunks of them, a lot of them in Christian media as well, don't seem to get it. Like, well, what's wrong about it? Well, what's wrong? So if, if this book is accepted, folks, where's the line? You can do whatever you want. Just put the word fiction on it, and hey. If a fiction, if the label fiction allows you to do whatever you want, it would just eventually legitimize pornography because it's seen as fiction, it's not real. And that's an argument that liberals use, that there's no problem with pornography. It's fiction, it's not really real. They're just acting. Doesn't matter what they represent that is disgusting and vile. Oh, this is not the same thing. It's a false representation of God. That's disgusting and vile. That's a perversion of true love. As pornography is a, a perversion of true love as found in a marriage. And both should bring a revulsion. Anyway, so CBN, I, there's no actual date on this article that I'm going to be referencing here, but this is from CBN. And this is written by Belinda Elliott, who, and the article is called, What's So Bad About the Shack? Again, the CBN again. When the novel The Shack was released by author William Paul Young, it created quite a controversy. Everyone, it seemed, had a strong opinion to offer about the book. Some embrace the story as a creative depiction of how God works in our lives. Yeah, it's a creative depiction. It's wrong everywhere. While others dismissed it as heresy. And to put that in quotation marks. Now, all of the debate piqued my interest. So I was very excited when I, re when I received the book as a Christmas present. I quickly devoured it, keeping an eye out for any heretical teachings. I love it was like, well, I was keeping my eye out for heretical teachings. As a novel, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the story quickly pulled me in and kept me turning pages. It was quite heartwarming and a satisfying work of fiction. As a work of heresy, however, I was sorely disappointed. Oh, that's a strange way to put that. She says, I just couldn't find much in the book that would, I would consider heretical. Well, do you truly love the God of the Bible? Do you truly know the Bible? 
and that is the defense. Well, I looked through it. I was looking for heresy, but I couldn't find any. It's like these people go into the Roman Catholic churches. You know, I was even... Uh, somebody sent me on a video, and I'm probably going to maybe do something on Tim Tebow at some stage. You know, kind of celebrity Christians who have a massive influence. Tim Tebow has that through his um, NFL career. Or well, it, was very, it was very brief, anyway, whatever it was. Apart from college football. But anyway... And he does go around to religious audiences and preaches. He is a teacher in that sense. Seems like a nice guy. Honestly. And I'd have no problem maybe taking some advice from him on exercise and things like that. Grant, theology? I'm, I don't even know if the man's a Christian. Don't have a clue. I have major doubts about that. Very prosperity gospel sounding. Promoted the shack, which makes me question anybody's salvation. I'm not saying, look, I don't go around and I don't think it's right to say you're lost, you're saved. We can all have errors and strange things we might like, especially if we're young in the Lord and things like that. But that would really make me question. Or you, it should make you question if you truly love the God of the Bible or not. Examine yourselves and see if you be in the faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Was it verse 8 or verse 5? That's a biblical commandment when you come to the Lord's table. This is 2 Corinthians. Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. That's a biblical command. Examine yourselves and make sure you're in the faith. Are you a new creature in Christ? Do you truly keep his commandments? I'm not saying that you keep them perfectly, but that is, is that a style of life? Do you walk in the narrow way? Matthew 7. Verse 13, enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. What does the shack represent? A wide gate where people say, oh, well, what's the problem? Worship now in churches. I, I was at churches before, and I didn't know. I was young in the Lord, and I didn't know that this was wrong. When I was at a church, the first church I went to for the first while I was first short time that I was a little bit after I was saved, they had plays on and representation. Again, you have the modern church does not know or is not interested in or does not want to study the regular principle of worship, as talked about in the Second and the Fourth Commandment, when it, re, re, when it deals with the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath today, which is the first day of the week. Where, you know, there's just no interest in it. It doesn't matter, you can do whatever you want, you can be creative in, in worship, you can... There's no regulation. Nada and Abihu... Why were they killed? Why was Cain and Abel? Why was there a difference between their worship in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 to 8? Cain was rejected because he didn't follow God. Abel did. He followed the example of the slaying of the animal. The church now is like, what's the problem? Here's a book that gets everything wrong and nobody can see anything about it. And I don't know if Wayne Jacobson doesn't get it either. The, the, the publisher, one of the publishers, Gwynblom Media, which originally published The Shack, and asks the question, does it devalue Scripture? 
just because we don't put scriptural addresses with our with numbers and colons at every allusion in the story does not mean that the Bible isn't the key source of virtually every consideration Mac has with God. There you have it. See, they, they argue both ways. It goes on to say scriptural teachings and references appear in almost every page. They are reworded in ways to be relevant to those reading the story, but at every point we sought to be true to the way God has revealed himself in the Bible, except for the literary character characterizations that m the movie that move the story forward is the core of the book that is one long bible <laughs> that's like funny that 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 radio program is saying that uh, it's core the book is one long bible study as mac seeks to resolve his anger of god and again the defenders of the book are not singing from the same hymn sheet even with themselves william paul young will say the shack is Theology. He says that in the foreword to the shack revisited. William Paul Young, seriously, if you want to find, if you want to go more in depth and expose this man even further, go to C. Baxter Kruger's book on this. But if you like the book, if you think it's great, it's teaching theology, hmm, you want to get, let's get deep into it, then they'll, he'll tell you everything. If you're a critic of it, He'll say, oh, you're coming from a place of fear, and is the problem really with you, and are you really attacking me, etc., and so on. What does, this ex what does this expose about the church? What does this shack tell us about the church? If somebody is a professing Christian, and comes to me and say, here's this great book called The Shack. You need to read it. I loved it. I have only two possibilities for you. You are dangerously naive, and you need to repent and study the scriptures. Because it is plainly, grossly, anti, unbiblical, and everything that is blasphemous against God. And to slap on, oh, now it's fiction, when it suits, won't fly. You were either grossly naive and a babe in Christ, or you don't know God at all. Now, maybe somebody who somewhat likes the shack but may have questions. You give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying you, you try to help people. What is the problem? Go through the regular principle of worship. How we're not to use any similitude of God the Father. Because, as Thomas Watson said, images are teachers of lies. This is Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.